Prosecutors in South Carolina are close to resting their case against Alec Murdoch. Over the past few weeks, they've been laying out evidence to prove the disbarred attorney did kill his wife and son in June of 2021. Prosecutors also saying Murdoch hired a hitman to kill him in an attempt to get a multi-million dollar life insurance settlement for his only surviving son. Murdoch was shot in the head, but it, the bullet barely grazed him. Uh, and not long after that, he called police and admitted that he orchestrated the whole scheme. The jury heard parts of that call on Thursday. I told him that things would get ready to get really bad and that I would be better off not here. And I asked him to shoot me. And you asked him to shoot you? That's correct. And what was his response? I mean, I think at first he was a little surprised. Let's bring in jury consultant and behavioral analyst uh, and an analysis expert, uh, Susan Constantine. Susan, uh, first I have to ask you about that call. The fact that he admitted to this scheme, does that bring more sympathy for him to the jurors or does that make him look more guilty? Well, it may bring more sympathy because he's admitting to where he lied, so he's kind of fessing up. The problem is, is that what they don't realize is that for a person to lie, it creates a lot of cognitive load. So people that are guilty naturally give away incriminating inf information to ease their stress within. So that's what liars tend to do. They give more incriminating information? They do. So in other words, when you read through a police statement, you will find that they will actually give you certain timelines to, let's say, uh, they went to the grocery store, but that actually timeline was linked to the actual murder. So what happens subconsciously, they embed the incriminating information to ease their own uh, satis guilt that they're feeling inside. So that's mm -hmm. what's really interesting is that everyone gives away the lie. They just don't know where it is unless there's someone like me to point it out. Okay, so in looking at the video evidence, I mean, we've seen a number of things uh, that were captured from the police interrogations of the night of the murders. Was there any behavior or mannerisms that gave him away that may have jumped out to the jury? Okay, so the most important thing is to look at, at his baseline behavior. We listened to the 911 call. We saw him at when he was being investigated, or uh, he was in the police car, and then also outside the scene of where it all occurred. Now start to do the comparisons. The, the best is the very first call. So when you get the call, listen to the, the expression. There's pauses that happen. You hear the cracking in the voice. Um, in the police interview, you would expect him to collapse. When people are in such extreme um, sadness or disbelief, they crumble. And you'll see that he can kind of go in and out of these moods and recover very quickly. The recovery was a big one for me. The crying, no tears, the, uh, the rocking, which is a self-soothing gesture when you're feeling stressed. It's not, a, it's not a stress feeling you should be feeling at that time. He should be feeling depleted. He should be feeling grief, despair, loss. And that is where the body shrinks, not is able to communicate so effectively. Okay, so to you, I, I kind of feel like I'm getting what I'm, I'm picking up what you're putting down, Susan. Are you saying that he is distributed or demonstrating a behavior that would say he's guilty? Correct. Okay. You know, we've seen a lot of evidence of the financial crimes, uh, fraud, uh, there's the drugs uh, that he's admitted to using. Does all of that play into his guilt as well in a juror's mind? In a juror's mind, it's going to be depending on how they, the, the, the state and the defense in their closing arguments. It's going to be really important for the state to create motive, to walk them through chronologically what led him to this. The other thing is, is that they're giving him way too much information, and there's already mm -hmm. information information overload, cognitive overload. They've already just thrown it away. They can't take any notes, so they're going to go on each other's uh, recall and deliberation. That's a scary thing. 61% of all jurors are visual learners. So the more video they can show, show his demeanor, show um, show all of the, the evidence that they've collected to create a timeline and also 
Give something very powerful at the beginning and powerful at the end because people will remember the beginning and the end for the state's case. What is also a problem though um, is, is, the, is for the defense. The defense is gonna say, hey guys, you don't have any evidence here. Right. There's no blood, there's nothing here. You can't, even though he committed all these financial crimes, Financial crimes doesn't equal murder. Right, absolutely. And again, he spent $50,000 a week on opioids, uh, but that doesn't necessarily prove that he's a murderer. Correct. All right, Susan, Constantine, uh, thank you. I learned something today. I appreciate your time. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. Wow. That is really interesting stuff. Yeah, it, when you go through something like this, you crumble. You don't sit upright and, and, and make these statements. But, oh, my gosh, I'm just, woo, interesting.